video is about matter, the stuff that makes up our world, and the properties of matter. So if you're looking at a forest, it's made of matter, it's made of stuff. If you're looking at stars, it's also made of stuff. If you're looking at something made by people, like for example, rods of steel, that's made of stuff. And so we're going to talk, or I'm going to talk, about what is this stuff? And it might be helpful if we're trying to define what is matter. We might want to think about what matter is not, just to be clear about things logically. We say that matter is not energy. You see the running guy on the right? He's got kinetic energy of motion. And there's several kinds of energy of motion. They're listed on the right. So you can see the moving water there on the right has the energy of motion. But if you look on the left side, there's also another kind of energy, which is potential energy. That's stored energy based on position. For example, the rocks on that mountain. Those are called erratic boulders that are left by a glacier in Yosemite National Park. And those have gravitational potential energy. If you were to push them over the side, they would, t as they tumble down the mountain, be gaining kinetic energy. So they have the potential to convert into kinetic energy. Interestingly, it's a little known fact that about a hundred years ago, the people in charge of Yosemite National Park were cavalry soldiers, and uh, for fun, or perhaps they thought it was for safety reasons, they would entertain themselves by pushing the boulders off the cliffs and watching them crash down. So now you know a little known fact. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. So here's a surfer taking up space and has mass. If you look at the wave, the water, and zoom in with a microscope and then a super duper microscope, you would see that that water is made of molecules of H2O, water. And if you broke down the water itself into its particular atoms, you'd notice that here's a model of an atom. This atom is made of protons and neutrons and electrons, but there's smaller parts to that atom that are called protons. If you broke down the protons into even smaller pieces in the 1960s, it was verified that there are smaller pieces called quarks. And beyond quarks is still an unanswered question. We don't know what's even smaller than quarks. There are a lot of very interesting theories but we kind of run up against a barrier of physics which makes it extremely difficult to actually see what's there. And here's what an atom more accurately looks like. You can see that the size of an atom is one angstrom, which is one ten billionth of a meter. But if you look inside, there's a tiny, tiny little nucleus here, this is a helium nucleus, which is one quadrillionth of a meter big. So, super tiny. Matter has volume. Volume is the space an object takes up. And here's the simplest example of volume of a cube. Um, the units for volume that we use in science are cubic meters or liters. And the nice thing is there's a correlation between the length measurements, meters, and liters turns out one cubic meter can hold a thousand liters. So solids, solid materials, have a fixed shape and a fixed, a fixed means unchanging and a fixed volume. This means they don't change their shape or their volume. And to find the volume of a solid that's regular, a regular solid, you could take the area of the base, here's a circular base in this case, and multiply it by the height. And that gives the volume of a cylindrical prism. Uh, or you could take, let's say it's a rectangular prism, you could find the area of the base and multiply that by the height too. If you have a liquid, those will change their shape to fit the container. And liquids also have a fixed volume. 
And when you measure a liquid, you measure from the bottom of the meniscus using a graduated cylinder. So graduated cylinders are here on the right. They have gradations that allow you to just look from the side and see how high did the water go. And that's how much volume you have. Be careful that you're checking the scale, that you're really looking at how much each little line represents because they're different on different cylinders. So look at the numbers and figure it out. But also we measure from the bottom of the meniscus, which is a curve of water. Watch this arrow. If I had water in this, the tip of my arrow would represent where the water is. It would be coming down. It would be curving up from the side, or curving down from the side, heading down, and then going up again. So there's a curvature of the water as it creeps up the side of the container, and that's called a meniscus. We have to measure at the bottom of that meniscus to be accurate. The meniscus is caused because water attaches to the side of the container, and water has cohesive properties, which means it holds together, so creeps up. And gases have volume that expands with more heat or less pressure, so they'll be flexible in their volume, and they also take the shape and volume of their container. We might want to think about comparing mass versus weight. Mass is the amount of matter in a substance. It's just the stuff in the substance. It's measured on a, tr a balance, and it's the, a measure of inertia, the tendency of matter to resist changes in motion. Mass is constant for an object. That's it, everywhere in the universe. It doesn't matter where it is, but mass is constant. And you can compare that to weight. Weight is a gravitational force of attraction on an object, so it's a measure of pull. Uh, you know, a force is a push or a pull. Weight is a pull force. It's measured on a spring scale, and it's a oh yeah here it's a measure of gravitational pull on an object. And weight then will change depending on where the object is in relation to a gravitational field. On this slideshow, I'm saying on, in relation to Earth, but you know, a spaceship is going to be influenced by whatever planet it's or sun it's orbiting near. So, um, really, it, weight is affected by the gravitational field from any source, really. So, mass you can think of a giant truck has a lot of inertia because it has so much mass. Um, it's heading towards you, you know, get out of the way. It's got a lot of energy of motion going on in there from its mass. And uh, yet weight will change depending on its position. So here's an astronaut on the left. As she goes into space, her mass does not change. Her body doesn't lose any particles or gain particles. So the mass stays the same, but her weight changes because she gets pulled down to Earth less the farther away she goes from Earth. So mass is measured on a balance. In our school we use a triple beam balance, but any balance will do anywhere. What you do is basically you're comparing, uh, let's say we put the astronaut on one pan here and we pile up standard kilogram weights on the other side and wait until it balances compared to our spring scale over here on the right, measuring a pull force. Properties of matter are of two kinds. You can have physical properties, and these are properties that you can observe and measure without changing the identity of the substance. So you can look at them and you won't change the thing. But chemical properties describe a substance's ability to participate in chemical reactions, so you're only going to see them if the thing is having a chemical reaction. And there's only two chemical properties that, in my classes, that you need to learn. It's flammability and reactivity. Everything else is a physical property of matter. So here's physical properties, for example. We have state at room temperature. 
um, room temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. Is the object of physically in is in, in its form? Is it a solid, liquid, or gas? That's the state that it is. Malleability refers to the ability of a substance to be rolled or pounded into various shapes without breaking. And ductility refers to the ability to be pulled into a wire. Solubility refers to the ability of a substance to dissolve completely in water. So for example, here's table salt, which is made of ions, little charged particles of sodium and chloride. And here I'm going to shake the salt shaker. and Sodium chloride, table salt, goes into the water. And if you notice really pretty quickly, the little green and red particles separate from each other. So this is dissolving, where the solute, which is the salt, dissolves completely into the solvent, which is water. Now we're going to look at a different example. This is a kind of salt that's less soluble than table salt. This is strontium phosphate, by the way. I'm going to shake it into the water and watch the particles as they hit the water some of them stay bound together. They stay clumped up. Not all of them dissolve. And you see the chunk of strontium phosphate just settling at the bottom of the water container. But some are dissolved, not all. So this is a substance that's less soluble than table salt. And if you look over here, you can see the number of ions that are dissolved versus bound. There's quite a few bit more that are bound than dissolved. So solubility refers to the ability of a substance to dissolve into another substance. And thermal conductivity is the ability to transfer heat easily. Electrical conductivity refers to the ability of a substance to conduct electricity. And we can check that by putting electrodes into water and seeing if a light bulb goes on. It isn't on right now with just plain water, but here I am shaking salt into the water. And notice how the light bulb starts to shine. That's because the salt has changed the water's ability to conduct electricity, because salt is electrically conductive. The battery causes a electric potential to be across these two areas, which causes a flow of electrons to go through the circuit, including through my salt water. So we know that salt dissolved in water is electrically conductive. And now I'm going to remove the salt and change our substance to sugar just to see, hey, does sugar conduct electricity? Let's find out. Shake it in the water. And I keep shaking, 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 pour it all in, but I see that the light bulb is not going on. So this tells me that sugar is not electrically conductive. and Electrical conductivity is called a physical property of matter because you're not changing the nature of the substance when you measure this property. Color is a physical property. For example, these coins are different colors because they're different materials. Hardness, you, you scratch it with a diamond and see if it scratches. Density is another physical property of matter. Density is an interesting property because it's a ratio, actually. It's the amount of matter in a given space. It's derived by taking the mass and dividing it by the volume. And notice there's three ways to do that. You could have it be a fraction, mass over volume. You could put mass inside the division bar and divide it by volume outside. Or you could put in the calculator mass first, then volume. The units would be grams per milliliter, if you've used milliliters for volume, or if you measured with a ruler and you got cubic centimeters for the volume, then you have grams per cubic centimeter. And what's interesting about density is that it has a lot of physical effects that are viewable on Earth. For example, less dense fluids will have less gravitational attraction to Earth than their surroundings so they tend to rise. More dense fluids will sink. So if you look at these examples here of more or less dense fluids, here we're heating up 
some gases. So their temperature is increasing, the particle spacing is increasing, they're expanding. We can see that as they expand, the gases become less dense, and so compared to the surrounding fluids, they rise. Chemical properties describe matter based on its ability to change into new arrangements of particles. So for example, here's burning propane. Propane has three carbons and eight hydrogens. You combine it with oxygen gas and everything remixes, recombines, and you end up with carbon dioxide, water, and heat and light. And so this is a rearrangement of particles. So this is a called a chemical reaction an exothermic reaction because it's giving off heat and light. So the two basic chemical properties that you need to know are flammability and reactivity. Flammability, obviously, I hope, is the ability of a substance to burn. Here's a forest fire burning. And reactivity is the tendency of a substance to change into new substances in the presence usually of oxygen but it could also be water or acid or other substances that it's reacting with. Rust is basically a slow burn of metal. It's an oxidation process, just like the wood is being oxidized on the left as it burns, so also the metal on the right is being oxidized by rust, only much more slowly. And there's two kinds of changes in chemistry. We have physical changes and chemical changes. Here's an example on the left of a volcano undergoing a physical change of state where the molten lava is going from liquid to solid and cooling. Whereas on the right we see a magnesium ribbon that is on fire. It's actually metal burning. Burning metal is undergoing a chemical change here. And physical changes are easy to undo, at least theoretically. If you took a can of Coca-Cola and smashed it, in theory, you could rebend it back again. But chemical changes cannot be undone except by another chemical change. So, for example, if you were going to bake a muffin, here's all your ingredients. You put them together and bake them, and they undergo a chemical reaction. Um, how could you get back the original egg, flour, and sugar? After the atoms rearrange, you, you can't do it, really. So you form new substances when atoms rearrange and you get this muffin here. So that's a chemical change. Here's an interesting chemical reaction for you. This is sucrose, powdered sugar, and in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid, 18 molar, kids don't try this at home, sulfuric acid is a strong dehydrator and sugar gets dehydrated by sulfuric acid and it's a strongly exothermic reaction, meaning a lot of heat gets produced. If I were to touch that glass beaker, it would be very hot. And there you see, go. wow, quite something Woo happening here. Uh, we have signs of chemical reaction going on here. Clearly you can see a color change. There's some gas being produced, and in the, you'll see it in bubbles, and some vapor lot of heat and it's moving even. This is the result of our chemical reaction. The hydrogen and oxygen in sucrose was blown off in the form of water vapor as little uh, pock marks you can see left on the remaining carbon show that there were bubbles forming. So we're just left with pure black carbon. So how you know you have a chemical change instead of a physical change is you can see if the color of the substance changed or if heat was given off or absorbed into the compound, if there's a smell given off, if there's light like with the magnesium ribbon burning, sound produced, or gas like just bubbles fizzing and foaming. So all of those are signs of chemical change, and I hope you enjoyed learning about properties of matter. Go. Hope that was helpful. Woohoo!